This is your brother Joseph Amato welcoming you once again to my channel. Happy New Year. This is my first video of the New Year. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy to be back with you today. Well, today's message is titled, Repent, Judgment is About to Fall. There is a pattern found repeatedly in Scripture when the natural order which was created by God is corrupted and disordered by sin that God uses the supernatural as a means to right the wrong. Also, when the cup of his wrath has been filled, it must be poured out. So simultaneously in these moments when judgment is seen on those in the enemy's camp, God displays great mercy and salvation upon the people of God as this is also seen with a great showing of miracles. We're at that time, beloved, once again. That is not to say that God does not judge his own house first, because he does. According to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Interesting question that Peter raises there. Verse 18, Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Beloved, this is a time for true repentance for all, both sinner and saint. Our view of this life must change. If we are to sow any seeds which will flourish in eternity, in these 100 years at best that we have upon this earth, we must move our focus off of the ease and comfort of the selfish, sinful life and on to the will of our Heavenly Father. How could God be truly righteous if he tolerated sin in his own people, and not from the ungodly. The Lord has one standard for all. Isaiah 51, 17 demonstrates God's discipline of his children. Isaiah prophesied, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling, and drained it out. The dregs here refer to drinking it down to the very last of it. For the believer today, because of the blood of Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins. Amen? But still, God chastises us like any good father would do. Remember, any trouble that we endure is for our betterment and the salvation of our souls. Not so for the unrepentant. Their judgment is condemnation because they reject Christ. They then must bear the full weight of the judgment against them for their own sins. We are all quick to quote John 3.16 as soon as we know it, my friend. But we really need to go on and read the next two verses at least. John 3, 17 and 18 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's go back to the first example of sin and judgment that we find in the scriptures. It happened in the Garden of Eden. We find it in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. In the Garden of Eden, it was created by God for his first man and his woman. This garden was new, clean, righteous, and perfect. Remember that in Genesis, as God creates each component of creation, he says, it is good. We hear that phrase repeatedly, my friend. In fact, 
We hear it seven times in the first chapter of Genesis. First, we hear it in verse 4 about light that God creates. Then, secondly, we hear it in verse 10 about dry land and the gathering waters together to make seas. Thirdly, we hear it in verse 12 about trees and vegetation being made. Fourthly, we hear it in verses 16 through 18 about God creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. Fifthly, we hear it in verse 21 about sea creatures and birds being made by the Lord. Sixth, we hear it in verse 25 about all living creatures that God made on the land. And seventh, we hear it in verse 31 about everything that God made altogether in creation. It is good. That is what God said. It is good. That's not situational ethics, my friend. That's not each person living their own truth, my sister. That's not rallying against the order of nature based on your feelings or what's happening in the world at the minute or the whim of men, my brother. As creator, he alone gets to make the distinction of what is good right and righteous, opposed to what is evil, wrong, and wicked. Be certain that unlike this generation, God does not change the rule book mid-game. The Lord does not alter definitions in his dictionary of terms. Sin is what God says it is. We read it throughout scripture. If you don't know, open that Bible, brother. Evil is what God calls evil. Good is what God calls good. This generation makes the mistake of calling good evil and evil good. Isaiah 5.20 warns against this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That woe there in that scripture means judgment. Judgment is soon coming upon this world, friend. What occurred in Genesis chapter 1 is divine order from the chaos that existed before God's Spirit moved and the Father spoke the word. When sin comes in, it causes this order once again. And then God has two responses. One is his awesome desire for mercy. Two is the required judgment. Since God is love, he is so merciful and patient. The apostle wrote in 1 John 4, 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Psalm 145, 8-9 through 9 tells us the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are are over all his works. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 concurs. Through, through, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. The Lord waits patiently until justice demands a judgment. Be certain, beloved, that the Holy One does not evade this duty. Even in this, he looks for a way to provide a covering. As Psalm 10, the latter part of verse 12 confirms, love covers all sins. Adam and Eve tried their best by hiding to cover their shame until God provided a blood sacrifice. Genesis 2.21 confirms this in saying, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. There must be blood. A sacrifice will cover sin, but Jesus' perfect sacrifice does something better than covering our sin, my friend. It cleanses sin away completely. As 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
In Jesus, our Savior alone, God fulfills the promise of Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let's further discuss this problem of sin. Should we continue living, or rather, should we continue living mainly for our own will and pleasure as Christians? Absolutely not. Satan's corruption takes root. How? Through the sins of mankind. So we can say, in effect, that Satan rides in on the sins of people. He has no other vehicle, no other entry point, no other way of gaining access but through sin. So although we are saved from sin through Jesus, we must now strive toward righteousness. Haven't we been, been called to holiness, beloved? Doesn't 1 Peter 1.16 remind us of the Lord's words in Leviticus, Be holy, for I am holy. As I said earlier, simultaneously, when God brings judgment to those in the enemy's camp, he brings a great showing of mercy and salvation to his own. We see this with a great showing of miracles. When sin mounts up against God and his people, judgment is required. Let's look at two examples of this in scripture. Judgment on Satan's camp. We see this when God washed the earth clean by the flood in Noah's day. It was a supernatural event because rain had never come from the sky before that moment. When Noah was preaching about righteousness and an opportunity for the evil people of his day to repent, and he told them of this thing called rain, they just wouldn't believe it because they had never seen it before. Supernatural miracles that were done, it rained, and it didn't rain a little. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But notice, in that event, there was something for the person of God the man of God, Noah, to do. God didn't build the ark. God gave Noah the plan, and Noah obeyed. He spent his days obeying the will of the Father, and that's how he was saved. Had he not obeyed, and there were no ark for he and his family to, to enter, would Noah have been saved? I don't know. Perhaps God would show mercy in some other way, but still the Lord tasked Noah with something to do. Another example of judgment on the enemy's camp is the judgment that God brought against Pharaoh and all of Egypt for holding his people, Israel, in bitter bondage of slavery. The end of it was the death of Pharaoh and his army. How did the Lord show supernatural miracles? by all the plagues that were visited upon Egypt. But for the people of God, it meant freedom. Once again, there was something for the people to do. They had to be obedient and do as the Lord through Moses commanded. And Moses himself had a lot to do, constantly appearing before Pharaoh as the Lord led, showing signs and wonders of the Lord. And God sent those plagues upon the enemies of his people. Wickedness is once again reaching an all-time high in our generation. I don't have to tell you that. Blood is once again required. Sin must be dealt with. For believers, the blood of Jesus is enough to cleanse us and keep us safe, like Noah's Ark. But we must remain under the protection of his blood. Let's go back to the story of how God used Moses to deliver the people of Israel. If the Israelites were to leave their houses on that dreadful night the death passed, after they had marked the blood of the lamb upon their doorposts, if they had left, they would no longer be under the protection of that blood. Outside the blood that covered the door 
protected only those within that home. Death that was meant for the sinful Egyptians would come upon them if they came out from the protection of that blood. Likewise, though we are washed with the holy blood of Jesus Christ, we must not return to sin. But we must remain under the protection of that holy blood by being obedient to the Lord's commands and following his word and knowing him. For those who won't come under the blood, their own blood will be required of them. So, so-called Christians who receive Christ but only live to please themselves and remain in sin, instead are choosing Babylon. That is a mixed life of good and evil together. That is the same choice that all sinners make, and it's the same choice that was made that first time in the garden. The problem occurs when we want to understand the knowledge of both good and evil. God wants us only to be knowledgeable about good and not know with intimacy evil. Paul told the Roman Christians in chapter 16 verses 19 through 20, For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The name of the tree that Adam and Eve partook of, the tree that they were told not to eat from, was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Consider what Paul said, we ought to be wise in what is good and have knowledge or have knowledge of good but simple or innocent concerning evil. In other words, no knowledge of evil. That's the problem with the tree in the middle of the garden. It's a tree of mixture, both good and evil. Again, Babylon is the mixture. Are you following me, beloved? Whenever you mix good and evil, it's like a half lie. When you have a half lie, you actually have a full lie. In fact, that is the most deceptive type of lie. Because there's just a little bit of truth in there. Just enough to deceive you. That's why Satan comes as an angel of light. As 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. There is no great thing if his, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Whenever Satan tempts you with sin, or tries to move you out of God's will for your life, he never comes to you as an evil, hideous, scary beast. Rather, he'll appear to you as that very thing that your carnal nature most craves. He's the one, remember, that comes only to steal from you, to kill you, or to destroy you, as Jesus warned in John 10.10. 10. But if you are not yielded to the Lord, he'll look to you as your very best friend. Likewise, the fruit from that tree in the middle of the garden that looks so good, but it is poisoned, it looks as though it will make you wise and balanced, but you'd be a fool to consume it. That's the nature and effect of sin. As Solomon warned us, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So I leave you with this, beloved. The Lord is very patient, much, much more than we are. Remember that when it appears that evildoers are left unchecked, judgment is coming, my friend. Wait a little bit longer on the Lord. 
he will not leave that task undone. Judgment is coming for the wicked and mercy for the people of God. The time of choosing sides is running out. Listen very closely when you read on your own Psalm 37. Read it and you will see the differences between what happens to the wicked and what happens to the righteous. God will not be mocked, the scriptures say. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Okay, my beloved, let's take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, O oh God. Jesus said that he sent us the Holy Spirit to teach us all things, to help us, to comfort us, to lead us, and to guide us into all truth, and that he would help us to understand the words of Jesus, your holy word, Lord. Father God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will touch my beloved friend who is watching right now. If they are saved, let them make a truer, real commitment to you. The days are growing darker and the time is growing short for us to get right with you. And Father, we know we cannot do it of our own accord. We need the precious blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all sin and help us to be your own we were bought with a precious price, a great price. It was not a light thing, O oh God, for you to send your only begotten Son to be crucified on Calvary's hill, to suffer, die, be buried, and raise again three days later. It was not a small thing for you to do to give your Son for us. Lord, and that requires all of us, every part that we have, to yield back to you. Father God, if there is someone who is watching that has not accepted you, help them to understand that Jesus is the only way to a right relationship with you. There is no other religion. There is no other teaching out there where God himself becomes man and suffers and dies in our place because he loved us so much that he spared nothing to redeem us back to himself. And I thank you, Lord, that not only is this a great story, but it's a true story. And I pray the reality of it by the power of your Holy Spirit we grab hold of the watcher right now that their life would be changed and they would truly know your love and know this great salvation that you provided through Jesus, your Holy Son. Amen and amen. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. The God of mercy, my friend, is also the God of judgment. He is the one true God. He is one in the same. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you so much that he provided with you the only way of escape from the judgment that's coming. And that is through the blood, the precious blood of Jesus, his son, your savior. And in that love, I love you as well, my friend. So happy to be back with you. Praise the Lord. Do pray for you that you will have a very blessed, happy, healthy, prosperous year this year as we go forth in faith and in victory in Jesus' holy name. Please like, subscribe, and share this video on my channel with whomever you think it would be a blessing to. And now let's pray our final prayer together that I love to pray on this channel. Pour out your spirit. That's our prayer. It's the name of the channel, but it's also... A heart cry to the Lord, Lord, even as you promised in Joel chapter 2, 
that in the last days you would pour out your spirit on all flesh. Even now, Father God, pour out your spirit on my friend who's watching, that they might know the reality of your presence, your great peace that surpasses all understanding, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what we are personally struggling with at this very moment, that you are the God that loves us and that has purposed us for great things in you and has drawn us into a real relationship with our Creator, our Redeemer, our Savior, and our King. We love you today, Lord. We, and once again, we pray these things in Jesus' holy, holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friend. I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye for now.